So now we're on to changes in atmospheric composition and looking at theories as to why this happens naturally in the past and now. And we'll look at theories about why this happens by man-made circumstances. And we'll look at that, we'll look at that more currently and in the future. So um, let's get started on natural circumstances of aerosols that change atmospheric compositions and the theories that are associated with them. Before we go into that, we have to talk about what aerosols are. And aerosols are air and suspended solids. So aerosol, air and, suspend and suspended solids can either be by natural circumstances or by man-made. We talk about aerosols in natural events. We're talking about things like volcanic eruptions. And we're talking about things like geysers blowing off in Yellowstone, or even ponds and lakes that are not well ventilated, and they are putting out sulfur dioxide. They have a smell like a uh, like an old egg, right? That rotten egg smell. Those are all natural sources of aerosols, and. We look at these aerosols on this chart for a very specific reason. This is the size of the solid that we're talking about, and that is in micrometers. So that is 10 to the ninth meters. And the US EPA has begun to recognize the health impacts of solids that are at certainly 10 um, um, micrometers, that's the kind of thing that you cough out. <clears throat> you cough out ash when you tend to take it in through your nose. You'll cough out cement dust for any, um, any contractors out there. And when you are in a dusty home, you end up coughing. Same thing with mold spores. So the EPA has well documented that at a level of 10 micrometers, there are health effects. Now they are starting to look at health effects and long-term lung cancer rates that are due to um, micrometer uh, diameters of 2.5. So one quarter what they were looking at before. When we look at natural events, the areas in yellow here include natural aerosols in that 2.5 or lower area that can easily get trapped in lung tissue. So what we are looking at are suspended atmospheric dusts from volcanoes, and we are also looking at gaseous contaminants and soot from forest fires. How do these natural aerosols impact our climate? How do they affect temperature and precipitation? Let's look at temperature first. Soot is the incomplete combustion products from fires and um, from, well, we'll leave it at fires. Um, and though that soot is well known to absorb heat readily, those particles can absorb radiant emissions as like platforms and they are usually dark and that's why they're so good and, and so absorbent. So when we look at soot, that's what we're looking at. When we look at things like, you might think of soot as gray. No, we're talking black soot here that would absorb radiant emissions. In addition, when it comes to the gaseous contaminants, we have a mixed bag on that. Sulfur dioxide, which is the rotten egg smell um, that are particles that cause that smell, those particles are actually microscopic solar reflectors. And um, as a result of that, there's some talk about the fact that the big industrial buildup of the 1950s in the United States put out so much sulfur that in fact it may have masked the global climate um, uh, change and increase in temperature by the reflection off of these microscopic sulfur particles. It's And it has a lot of data to back that up. When the Clean Air Act of the 1970s 
regulated sulfur emissions, that's when we started to see the increases in temperature through the, from the 1980s onward. So we had a lot of industrialization in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, but it may have been emitting so much sulfur dioxide that it actually reflected um, radiant emissions. We'll talk more about the impacts of this soon. Um, in terms of nitrous oxides, those are also incomplete combustion. In regards to natural aerosols, the nitrous oxides are coming out of forest fires. So that when we look at the California forest fires, we are looking at increased nitrous oxides due to natural circumstances. When we look at, at impact change in regard to precipitation and the impact of these natural aerosols, these are acting as particles, which can act as new, um, condensation nuclei. You know about condensation nuclei. They can um, act as platforms for the formation of cloud droplets. So there are theories that these natural aerosols could promote more precipitation in the environment and subsequently um, cool the environment. And we will look into a bit more about that data. Um, in terms of, yes, in terms of the um, natural aerosols and volcanic eruption and the suspended atmospheric particles, the big ones are the volcanoes. They are very prominent and they definitely impact climate um, for precipitation and for temperature. And we're going to get into that now in a second because they put out enormous amounts of sulfur dioxide straight from the, um, the mantle of the earth. These reflecting particles were noted that they brightened clouds first before we actually understood what they, what sulfur dioxide particles do. And you see some evidence of it right there, right? So brighten clouds and they tend to, as those clouds cover, reduce sunlight to the surface. These particles, these sulfur dioxide particles are shot up from volcanoes straight into the stratosphere. You can see it there. Um, that is not as effective as if they were lower. So that is why you are seeing these lower bright clouds here, because the reflection is really off of the lower clouds. I know that seems counterintuitive, but higher clouds are generally thinner. They don't do as well as reflecting at reflecting as lower clouds that have more moisture in them that are dark, that are more dense. They can do a better job at reflecting. And so when we talk about temperature and natural events, volcanoes are the big one for reducing temperature. This is in your book, um, a relation to um, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, during a time when temperature was moving above the mean that had been looked at back in the 1960s for the mean there. And when you look at it, yeah, the temperature was rising. Then Mount Pinatubo, Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines and the silicon dioxide particles scattered throughout the world, very well traced by satellite. And temperatures for about the next 18 months were lower than normal. Some people can extrapolate this out to about two years as well. But um, that was a really good representation of the impact of volcanoes on climate change. And I can give you some more data that when we looked at other volcanoes um, that, were, that were looking at years on the independent axis, and we are not looking at temperature here, we are looking at solar radiation transmitted to the ground. So we are looking at solar radiation rather than temperature here. And this is a um, volcanic eruption index, a smaller volcano. This is the, um, the location of the 
tornado via lat uh, not tornado sorry volcano via latitude fuego was also a smaller um volcano volcanic eruption a big one el chicon hope i'm pronouncing that correctly um in um 1982 i believe very big volcanic blast and really, really caused a dip in solar radiation in the year to year and a half to two years afterwards. And Mount Pinatubo caused a dip that had, um, it was interesting because it caused a broader dip. This is a dip in a recovery. This is a broader dip. So there's a lot of um, uh, research that needs to be done on the impact of silicate reflectors, especially natural ones, in the stratosphere put up there directly by volca volcanoes. What is the impact of climate, uh, what is the impact of volcanoes on climate and, and in particular precipitation? We talked about the fact that this silicon dioxide acts as condensation nuclei or platforms for more cloud droplets. And it would make sense that if you had more cloud droplets in the atmosphere, you would have more precipitation that might possibly cool the atmosphere as it evaporates off. But the data shows that global precipitation after major eruptions actually falls. And there are several theories as to why that data shows this. Is it because those platforms support smaller cloud droplets that don't exactly condense into larger cloud droplets that can fall. That might be the case. Um, some people say that there are cooler temperatures due to the reflectivity of the solar emissions and therefore there is less evaporation off the ocean so there is less moisture in the air to um, produce precipitation due to volcanic events. Some people postulate that there's an, a, a stronger El Nino. Since you've already studied an El Nino, let's look into whether or not the theory of the El Nino can explain the data of Mount Pinatubo. And when you look at that, you look at the data first because the data is closest and the data is most objective. The data from the Philippines in this area on the map showed that after the eruption for one to two years, the temperatures were cooler and that the precipitation was reduced so the climate was drier for those one to two years. Does an El Nino fit into that pattern of cool temperatures and less precipitation? Well, we know that an El Nino lasts one, maybe two years, so the timing seems right. Let's look at what an El Nino represents and whether or not it fits into that data. An El Nino represents a high surface pressure system in the Western Pacific by the Philippines. That high um, uh, that high surface, that surface high drives winds and water that are warm due to the equatorial radiant environment into the South America, um, it, South American countries, and it undermines the upwelling and produces a warm area off, off the equator that is really um, amplified by an El Nino. With this surface high here, let's go back and explain that. That surface high would be associated with warming temperatures and would be associated with less precipitation. Remember, when you think about it, you're thinking warm and dry surface high, remember? So does that fit because we were noting cooler temperatures in the Philippines after Mount Pinatubo. No, that doesn't fit. We would be thinking warm and dry, and the El Nino, pad, the El Nino theory that's associated with climate change after the natural events doesn't seem to fit here. Go on. Um, Let's get into greenhouse gases and aerosols on a man-made level in the next lecture.